Roma locuta est causa finita. Rome has spoken. The matter is settled. Christ gave doctrinal authority and infallibility to the rulers of his church to safeguard the liturgy and confidently explain the deposit of the faith. The church's infallibility extends to disciplinary laws, for example, the communion fast and liturgical changes. According to the promise of Christ, the Catholic Church exercises infallibility in these matters in order to define, safeguard, and defend Christ's teachings and to be for all mankind a trustworthy teacher of the Christian way of life. The Catholic Church can never sanction a universal law against faith or morals. It cannot sanction a liturgy that's sacrilegious or harmful to souls. Monsignor Van Nort writes, The security of the deposit of faith requires the effective warding off or elimination of all error which may be opposed to it. This would, simply, this would be simply impossible without infallibility in related matters. If the church were infallible only in the field of revealed truth and not in that of matters annexed thereto, such as the liturgy or the canonization of saints, it would be like a general who was assigned to defend a city but was given no authority to build up defenses or destroy the material which the enemy had assembled. It'd be like a caretaker to whom the master of the house had said, take care that my house doesn't burn down, but don't put out any flames as long as they remain nearby. My dearly beloved in Christ, personal opinions or feelings must never override the teaching authority of the church. However, since the election of John the Twenty Third in 1958, not only modernists have become Pope sifters, but even some who are considered conservative Catholics. By this is meant that they pick and choose which papal teachings they will accept and which they will reject. As a result, they pontificate, claiming for themselves the supreme authority of the Catholic Church. They decide what they will obey and what they will reject. The founder of the Society of St. Pius X, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, and his followers also sift what their Pope says. When the teachings are in accord with tradition, they accept them. If in the minds of the members of the SSPX they're not in accord with tradition, the teachings are rejected. Their clergy and laity have become accustomed to criticize and judge him whom they call Pope. An SSPX priest told me once that before Mass he praised the rosary for the conversion of the Pope, that he becomes a Catholic again. Like the modernists and pseudo-traditionalists, they claim for themselves the supreme authority of the Church. Some conservatives severely judge and criticize the decisions of the true vicars of Christ, including Pope Pius XII, who died in 1958. They denigrate him, claiming that he was Pope with a lack of common sense, who was too credulous and had his head in the clouds. My dear and beloved in Christ, obviously hindsight is always better than foresight. Nevertheless, it's presumptuous to try to judge what the Holy Father should or should not have done. He was surrounded by enemies and did not know whom he could trust. His statement to a cardinal, after me, the deluge, shows that he knew what was coming. Much earlier, he confined it to Count Enrico Pietro Galeazzi. I hear around me so-called reformers who want to dismantle the holy sanctuary, destroy the universal flame of the church, discard all her adornments, and smite her with remorse for her heroic past. I believe Pope Pius XII did the best he could under the circumstances. We must also remember that God is in control and brings his will to fruition. It's wrong to make sweeping judgments upon the Holy Father, question his mental state, and reject certain liturgical changes based on personal preference. A female author who wrote an inflammatory book against Popes Benedict XV, Pius XI, and Pius XII told me, 
I never agreed with the doctrine of papal infallibility. If I were alive during the First Vatican Council, which defined papal infallibility in 1870, I probably would have left the church and become an old Catholic. In a letter, she wrote, I think making an issue of it, papal infallibility, in 1870 was unnecessary. As for the word vicar of Christ, it only means deputy, not in reincarnation of God. For her, the papal office was a mere political entity with no divine entitlement for safeguarding the faith. This obviously is not the Catholic stance. My dearly beloved in Christ, our our Lord bestowed primacy and infallibility upon St. Peter and his legitimate successors in order to ensure the continuity of his church and its liturgy and teachings despite the changeableness of the world. The miraculous permanence, strength, and unchangeableness of the Catholic Church through the ages are a direct result of the special protection of God. Obedience to the true vicars of Christ and the infallible teachings of the Church are the distinguishing characteristics of a true Catholic. A true Pope is the immediate superior of all Catholics. Opposition to the reforms of Pope Pius XII is tantamount to ones objecting to the reforms of the Council of Trent. Nevertheless, some clergymen reject the liturgical practice of Pope Pius XII adhering to the liturgy of Pope St. Pius X because they feel safe following a canonized saint. Why stop at Pope St. Pius X? Why not go back to Pope St. Pius V? A rejection of liturgical and disciplinary laws due to personal preference of one pope over another leads to an endless line of questioning, rejecting the teaching authority of a true pope and setting oneself up as the final word on the matter. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. The current confusion, disorder, and division among traditional Catholics are due to the fact that the chair of St. Peter is vacant and the church lacks the clear guidance of an infallible vicar of Christ. In some cases, the personal opinions of conservative and traditional clergy and laity influence them to such a degree that they choose to reject certain decisions of the true Pope, Pope Pius XII, regarding the sacred liturgy. Specifically, these rejections are as follows. Elimination of the Leonine prayers after Mass for the conversion of Russia and for the freedom and exaltation of the Church. A rejection of liturgical feasts such as St. Joseph the Worker, May 1st. A rejection of the restored Holy Week liturgy of Pope Pius XII. And ending the Lenten fast on noon on Holy Saturday. Regarding the Leonine prayers, Pope Leo XIII issued decrees in 1884 and 1886 that certain prayers, three Hail Marys, a Hail Holy Queen, and two other prayers, be recited after low mass for the needs of the church. In 1930, Pope Pius XI commanded that the Leonine prayers be recited for the conversion of Russia. Although some priests omit these prayers, Russia has not been converted, even though on the surface its leaders have allowed a little more freedom. The majority of Russians are still atheists or schismatics. They've not converted to the Catholic faith. And then regarding the observance of the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, of all the political and moral evils of our era, Our Lady of Fatima singled out communism as the most formidable enemy of the church. Pope Pius XI named St. Joseph as the heavenly patron of the vast campaign of the church against world communism. Why was St. Joseph chosen? The Holy Father declared he belongs to the working class and he bore the burdens of poverty for himself and the Holy Family, whose tender and vigilant head he was. In a life of faithful performance of everyday duties, he left an example for all those who must gain their bread by the toil of their hands. He won for himself the title of the just, serving thus as a living model of that Christian justice which should reign in social life. This shows the Holy Father's thinking 
on the menace of communism. For though it also counts many intellectuals among its dedicated proponents, it's largely the working class and the poor whom it enslaves. The method of combating it grows ever more complex because of its cunning and deceitful methods and the untiring zeal of its agents. It requires more than human skill to outwit and undo the masters of deceit who plan and direct its operations and carry them into execution with ruthless brutality. The wisdom of appointing St. Joseph, the heavenly patron of the, those combating this diabolical movement, is clearly evident. In 1955, Pope Pius XII further indicated St. Joseph's role in the fight against communism when he proclaimed May 1st as the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker. This day, now known as International Workers' Day, had been set aside by the Communist Party as a day of worldwide public demonstrations on a grandiose scale to demonstrate and proclaim the so-called glories of communism and to flaunt its claims of tremendous progress and power. By dedicating this day to St. Joseph, the Holy Father so to say, Christianized it as a holy day for workmen and thus offered a powerful challenge on the part of the church to counteract the influence of communism. Some object to the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker because it occurs on May Day, a communist celebration of the idealized worker. Sadly, they don't realize that this feast day was intended to provide a Catholic response to communism and to focus attention on labor and labors from a religious, not Marxist, viewpoint. A casual study of liturgical history would show anyone that the practice of the church from its inception was to replace pagan customs, ceremonies, and festivals with Catholic ones whenever possible. In his decree, Pope Pius XII stated, the church always moved by religious considerations has condemned the various systems of Marxist socialism, and she condemns them still. For it is ever her duty and right to save men from movements and influences that endanger their everlasting salvation. Consequently, the Supreme Pontiff instituted the liturgical feast of St. Joseph the Worker as to be an opposing current to the hatred, discord, and violence that communists have marked their observance of May Day. St. Joseph is put before the working man and woman as a model because he excelled in the spirit of diligence, patience, and charity towards God and neighbor. He gave a just day's work as a humble craftsman and was resourceful in gaining an honest livelihood. It's precisely those whose worldly circumstances are similar to his own that St. Joseph is best able to impart the secret of true success in work. Socialists and radicals are ever trying to stir up discontent and grievances among workers because they need conflict to gain their ends. By accenting Christian concepts of labor and the faithful fulfillment of daily duty, as shown in the life of St. Joseph, by making workers realize the privilege of labor and the part it plays in sanctifying life, the church hopes to offset subversive tactics. Accordingly, St. Joseph is a wise choice as patron both of workers and of the church's labor leader in the fight against communism. It's interesting to know, while some confused souls boycott the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker established by Pope Pius XII in 1955, they nevertheless celebrate the Feast of the Queenship of Our Lady, May 31st, instituted by Pope Pius XII in 1954. There's a lot of picking and choosing here. It's a matter of subjective preference rather than based on an objective rule. Those who object to the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker claim that the previous Feast of the Solemnity of St. Joseph should not have been suppressed. However, true popes had the power to establish or suppress feast days. Such a power does not interfere with or negate in any way the deposit of faith. Instead, it's for the spiritual welfare of souls. The Feast of the Divine Maternity or the Maternity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, October 11th, after having been suppressed by St. Pius X, was restored by 
Pope Pius XI in 1931, on the occasion of the 15th centenary of the Council of Ephesus, which recognized the Mother of Christ as the true Mother of God. I'll conclude with a true story that exemplifies divine providence, God's loving care. It was written by Archbishop Sheen for Look magazine in 1955 concerning Pope Pius XII. The event took place in Germany many years before he was elected as a pope. At the time, Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli was serving as the papal nuncio in Munich. His anti-communist spirit and moral courage achieved through prayer and a virtuous life are an inspiration to all. On the seventh day of April in the year 1919, under the leadership of a sailor, Rudolf Egelhofer, and three Bolshevik commissars, there was an attempt to set up a Soviet republic. Communist gunmen roamed the streets. Then a Red Army was created, which going into action killed 325 people on April 25th in Munich alone. But the number might have been 326. They had raked with machine gun fire the home of Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli, the papal nuncio. Unmoved by threats, he had mounted the pulpit of the Munich Cathedral against the orders of the Red Committee. Finally, they decided to assassinate him. On the 29th day of April at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Commander Seiler of the Red Army of the South and his aide, Bongrest, armed with orders from Egelhofer, appeared at the door of the Archbishop's house in company with a group of Red sailors. The thugs, gaining entrance to the house by threatening the servant with hand grenades, made their way to the library and awaited the appearance of their prey. Seiler took up his appearance closest to the door with pistol drawn. The gunmen stood round in a semicircle, some with drawn guns, some with hand grenades. Suddenly the wanted man appeared. With a blasphemy, Seiler threw out his pistol hand. It hit the pectoral cross on the man's chest. This tall, lean figure grasping the pectoral cross and facing the raised guns, said in soft, low tones, I am not afraid. I am in God's hands. But you gain nothing. I am interested only in saving my people. Under the gaze of those spiritual eyes, no one dared pull a trigger. Neither Siley nor Bongritz nor the others knew why they did not shoot. When they got to headquarters, they were unable to explain to Egelhofer why they did not kill that man. They were never able to explain why a pair of eyes, a lean figure holding a cross, and a soft voice should be more powerful than their guns and grenades. There was only one thing that was certain. From that day on, that man would be afraid of absolutely nothing in all the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.